The gentleman you see before you is Mr. Bob Daly, the 1949 National Stunt Champion. Bob is also the creator of one of the most unique and innovative forms of wing construction in the history of the stunt event. This technique is known as I-beam construction, and it has been used in the design of many highly successful competition stunters over the years. The fact that this construction has endured with little additional refinement for almost 50 years is testament to Bob's genius. The stunt community certainly owes a debt of gratitude to Bob for his achievements, and in appreciation, this video is dedicated to the father of the I-beam wing. I-beam construction was embraced early on by the members of the Strathmore Club of Detroit, and most of the members incorporated it in their original design stunters. One of the first to employ the I-beam concept was Jim Ebiger, who used it to full advantage in his unforgettable Neptune design. Here's Fred Karn's recent rendition of Jim's Neptune under construction. It's easy to see where the name I-beam came from if you study the main spar shape. It forms a capital I if viewed from the end. Strip ribs are positioned on the top and bottom of the wing at each rib station and are supported by the spar. It may look complicated, but it goes together quite easily. The second generation of stunt flyers to use I-beam construction included these two young champions. Steve Woolley used it in his gorgeous Argus design, as did Bill Werwidge in the legendary Ares. Bill felt so strongly about the advantages of the technique that he designed and built most of his models around the I-beam wing. He probably knows more about this type of construction than anyone else, by virtue of the number of models he's built over the years. He started building I-beam wing stunners in 1955, and he's still designing around the concept to this day. In this video, Bill will guide us through the construction of an I-beam wing as he produces a replica of his three-time national champion, Ares. Before we hear from Bill, let's take a few moments to look at just a few of the many famous I-beam stunners that he has produced. Back in 1953, um, and I suppose you'd have to consider this 53-54 period, 
Uh, I first saw these I-beam airplanes and uh, I saw as many of, as six or seven at a time. I was very impressed with them. They were uh, all beautifully finished. Um, they were airplanes that uh, were totally outstanding on the field. There was little known about the way they were built. The uh, Strathmore Club pretty much kept them a secret. And uh, I was very interested in them. I was flying Barnstormers at the time, and that was uh, pretty much the, uh, the main airplane of our, our area. And uh, because the information was so hard to come by on these airplanes, uh, it took me a little time uh, to, to come up with uh, any semblance of order of the way they were built. Uh, I built the, the first ones strictly from seeing uh, the, the construction, strictly from seeing the, uh, the combat planes, their combat planes, which were in essence the same, mostly with straight spars, not a true I-beam. Uh, all this seemed very complicated at, uh, you know, the age of 11. And, uh, but when you desire something bad enough, you go ahead and, uh, and you keep finding ways to, uh, to achieve this goal. As I got further along, uh, I received help from uh, Art Pulowski, uh, Milton Booz, Roland McDonald. And uh, while I never received plans, airfoils, numbers per se. Uh, what I did get was a, a true feeling of the way the airplanes were built and finished. And back in, those, in that period I would build uh, four or five airplanes a year this way because time was uh, you know, not of the essence and uh, the desire was. So I would build in one year, the Thor, the Comet, uh, the Vulcan, I had uh, an ongoing project building summer, winter, there were always airplanes being built while they were being flown. So my knowledge moved fairly rapidly on this, on this type of construction and this type of airplane. And uh, I would have to say that uh, this is... Uh, about a three-year period to really understand the way these airplanes were built. There were no plans and uh, originally there was no help. So uh, I just w worked my way through it and uh, what I'm going to do is attempt uh, to show you the way I learned to do it with the, the drawing of the beams, the, the methods. I've had an awful lot of questions as classic has become popular now on uh, the way these airplanes were built and uh, I had assumed because of the kits and things that people pretty much understood the way they were built but I find a lot of the same questions coming from uh, different people. So what I'd like to do is uh, as we move along through this we're going to build a complete Ares wing and uh, try to answer any of the questions as well as showing uh, which we'll initially start with the way the uh, the way the wing is plotted and the way the airfoil is plotted and the way you come up with your beam sizes this whole thing while thought to be complicated complex and appears to be complex uh, and made worse by the air Ambroid kit and things that were uh, you know had a lot of voodoo in them this uh, this will will should pan out uh, to be an, an easier project for most people than they would think. Most of you'll be building an I beam model for the very first time. Uh, you'll be working from these plans. All the work is done for you. All the plotting is, is done ahead of time. Uh, for those of you who wish to design an I-beam for yourself, to build, build your own design model, uh, there's a few guidelines that must be followed. And uh, we'll lay those out for you right now. To illustrate the layout procedure, let's start with a set of stock Aries plans. 
You might think that the tapers in the spar location of an I-beam wing would be determined by a top view platform, but this is not the case. The term I-beam refers to the shape of the spar when viewed from the end. The center core of the spar is made from one quarter inch thick balsa. One sixteenth inch plywood doublers are added to the front and back of this core piece. One eighth inch thick top and bottom caps are added. And the finished shape is that of a capital I. Make a root template of the aerofoil from plastic or aluminum. The surface of this template should be very smooth and accurate for the operations to follow. Draw the leading and trailing edge placement of the tip rib onto the center line of the drawing of the root rib. In the case of the Aries, the tip leading edge is one and five eighths inches behind the root leading edge position. Carefully position the rib template so it touches the top of the leading edge and trailing edge pieces. Trace around the rib template with a pencil to establish the upper tip rib profile. Measure down a quarter of an inch from the top of the tip rib profile and spar location and make a mark. This mark indicates the top of the 1 8 inch top cap of the tip rib. Repeat the process to establish the bottom of the tip rib drawing. The distance between the two scribed lines is the depth of the I-beam spar at the tip rib position. Using the drawing you just made, develop tip rib jigs to support each end of the I-beam spar. The next step would be to laminate the fuselage sides. As you can see, we've done that right here. This is the balsa fuselage side. If you, I recommend this if you're going to use a heavier motor, uh, a newer Schnurley or a Tiger 46. This is balsa, doubler, carbon veil, balsa side. This is done with a liberal amount of epoxy. This is one of the few times that you would use this, this amount of epoxy, but there's no integrity to the carbon veil if there's not enough epoxy. So use a slow cure epoxy, lay it out flat, preferably between two very flat surfaces, and clamp it overnight. If you're going to use a Fox, something in, in the lightweight category, Stay right with the 16th inch plywood doublers as per the plan. There's no need to go to this with a, with a light motor. The next thing we're going to do is square these body sides up. We'll do that by cutting the top of the fuselage sides perfectly parallel. I prefer to use a balsa stripper to trim the edges of the fuselage sides. This one is custom made by Les Nering, but any of the ones available from a hobby shop will work fine. Lay a long metal straight edge over the side assembly and tape it down at both ends. Pressing down firmly on the straight edge, begin cutting the side with the stripper. Be sure to keep the blade tight against the straight edge. When you finish cutting the side, sand the front edge square. Measuring from the plans, begin marking the outlines of the fuselage sides. Accuracy counts in this operation, so work slowly and carefully.
Be sure to use a small square when laying out the center section openings. Be especially careful when laying out the wing center line. With the doublers to the inside, place one of the sides over the other. Use a scrap balsa filler piece behind the doublers. Then tape the sides together accurately. Using a scroll saw, cut out the fuselage openings in the external outline. Sand the edges and file the openings very carefully. There, we've completed our fuselage sides. Take a little time when you do these. Um, there's really no, uh, you'll never have them too perfect, but you, they could certainly be, uh, be inaccurate. I've gone ahead and put exact center lines on everything, both sides. We're going to put this in a fuselage jig. We'll give you just a, a quick overview of that, uh, as that is built just like every other every other airplane. I've taken the liberty to make the uh, make the motor mounts. These start out as three eighths by half. They're then relieved an eighth of an inch which gives you room to move your tank further down. You can always shim back up. They're drilled. Then as you can see, we slot this just barely, very, very, very small grooves on the jigsaw just to give more gluing surface. This isn't absolutely necessary, but uh, it certainly can't hurt anything. Motor mount beam location is very important. Misaligned beams will stress the case when the engine is bolted to them, causing poor engine runs. So take some time here and get things straight. Recheck the fit of the beams before gluing. Use slow cure epoxy to attach the beams.
Place weights on or clamp the beam and let the epoxy cure thoroughly. Time to make a spar. As you can see, we've already moved forward in this area. This is a quarter inch balsa center, joined diagonally. You can make that joint four, four and a half inches across. This is mahogany plywood on either side. The mahogany plywood uh, is somewhat lighter than the birch although the birch is acceptable. Uh, it's available at marine supply places. And uh, if you look around, it's, it's a, it seems to have come available again in the last four or five years. This is what I used on all my older airplanes. And uh, the weight difference uh, makes it worth looking for. I'm going to go ahead right now and lay the spar out for you and do the drawing and then we'll go ahead and, and construct this spar. Start by taking the spar length dimensions from the plans. Note the two inch symmetry that is built into the Aries. Measuring from the center of the spar, mark each end accordingly. Mark the position of the center line at the root. Lay a long and accurate metal straight edge on the spar. Line it up at the root mark and average or measure the center of the spar at the tip and carefully draw in the center line. Measure the depth of the spar without the caps from the plans and mark the spar. Follow the same procedure and mark the spar depth at the tips. Measure the width of the fuselage at the spar location and transfer these dimensions to the spar. Draw parallel lines on the spar where the fuselage will be positioned. Now using the straight edge, connect the ends of the parallel lines with the corresponding tip marks. This operation will require you to draw four accurate lines. Mark the inboard spar for the lead out clearance slot. This slot should be no more than 332nd inch wide. Using a circle template, mark a half inch diameter semicircle at each end of what will become the bell crank clearance slot. Notice that the hole is laid out off-center. 
and is longer than the Aries plans depict. The reason for this is that I intend to use a four inch belt crank in this model and it will require extra clearance. Whether a three or four inch belt crank is to be used, the center line of the belt crank is positioned to allow a straight 90 degree hookup to the platform. Cut as far to length. Now very carefully, staying just outside of the line, saw the spar to shape. Using a 150 grit sandpaper block, carefully sand to the finished dimension. Next, saw out the bell crank clearance slot. Sand the slot smooth. Now saw out the lead out slot in the inboard spot. Sand the slot smooth. On the forward face of the spar, relieve the inboard end of this slot to ensure front lead out clearance throughout its range of travel. Measure the depth of the spar triplers. These will fit between the bell crank clearance slot and the edge of the spar on both top and bottom. Lay them out on a sheet of 16th inch plywood and then saw them to size. Sand the edges smooth and then bevel the ends. Check the fit of the triplers on the spar and then install them using a slow cure epoxy. Wipe off any excess epoxy with a paper towel. Lay the assembly onto a flat surface. Clamp or weight the spar assembly and let it cure overnight.
When cured, sand the triplers flush with the top and bottom of the spar. Well, we've completed our spar, ready for capping. We're going to use carbon fiber on the caps. Now, this is not necessary, absolutely necessary, because for years we never used it. It's just that it's there for the taking now, and the weight trade-off uh, certainly makes it hard to pass up. Now, we'll also do the same thing vertically on the trailing edges. What I'm going to do now is sand this both sides of this carbon. You want to, we're going to hot stuff this with a slow hot stuff. And uh, we'll, we'll show you that in some detail. Use your favorite method to cut the spar caps and trailing edges. In this case, I use a Dremel table saw. Lightly sand the 7,000th unidirectional carbon. Wipe off the carbon dust with a clean rag. Coat the part to be laminated with slow dry CA. In this case, we are gluing the inside face of one of the trailing edges. Smooth the CA out quickly and evenly. Place the trailing edge face down against the straight edge of the carbon fiber. Press down with your palms to ensure that a tight joint is achieved. Now place the metal straight edge against the trailing edge. Use a very sharp number 11 blade knife to cut it free from the carbon sheet. Block sand the edges against a flat surface. Slightly round the edges of the carbon to prevent it from possibly cutting into the covering later on. The spar top and bottom caps are glued, trimmed, and sanded in exactly the same manner as the trailing edge.
All right, we've laminated everything together. We've got our four top and bottom pieces, and we've also done the trailing edges. What we're going to do now, we fit the ends, cut the ends, squared them, make sure that everything joins properly. What we're going to do now is laminate the caps onto the spar. Now they go face down. In other words, the carbon joins the plywood. Apply an even amount of Slow Cure CA onto the top of the outside spar half. Spread the CA around to ensure an even coverage. Lay the cap onto a flat surface. Invert the spar and lower it onto the cap. Align carefully and apply pressure. I find the two aluminum sanding bars do a good job of evenly distributing the pressure. Repeat this process for the bottom surface of the outside spar half. To prevent the lead out clearance slot from collapsing, temporarily insert a 332nd inch balsa shim. Repeat the gluing process for the remaining two spar caps. Be sure the caps fit tightly together at the center. Sand the spar carefully against a flat surface. Using either a Zona saw or a Dremel tool fitted with a cutting disc, trim the caps at the ends of the spar. Square up the ends with a sanding block. Install 1 16th inch ply spark top caps.
I prefer the Bob Smith brand Slow Cure CA for all carbon laminating and spar construction applications. Sand the spar carefully against a flat surface. Test fit the fuselage sides onto the spar. Make sure the sides don't pinch. The completed spar with carbon caps weighs 2.41 ounces. All right, with the spar complete, we're moving on to the landing gear. We've taken the liberty to bend this off camera. You may notice that the torsion bar is shorter on this than on the plans. The reason being we no longer use J-bolts. What we're using here is copper wire. I find this system to be a little bit lighter and last, seems to last indefinitely. We'll take you through that. Position a landing gear leg on the spar and lightly tack with CA glue. Repeat the process for the other gear leg. Using a drill press fitted with a 1 16th or smaller bit, drill eight sets of holes. The copper wire retainers will fit through these holes to anchor the gear legs later on. Here's the hole pattern. Now break the legs loose from the spar and put aside. Now that our motor mounts have cured, we've gone ahead and cut out our doubler. This goes between the beams. Our light ply 
first farmer and our boss of farmers. We're going to assemble these in a CSC fuselage fixture. Uh, you use your own method, whatever makes you happy, and uh, we'll come back with this assembled and uh, be ready to build our wing. Here are the matching fuselage sides, the crutch block, the light fly firewall, and the balsa formers. Accuracy in fabrication of these parts is a must to achieve a competitive model. The I-beam spar is used here to help in alignment of the fuselage sides in the fixture before gluing. Note the use of the square against the sides and the front spar face. Once perfect alignment of the sides is achieved, then the remainder of the formers are fitted and glued. Patience here will yield a better model when completed. Well, it's time to cut ribs. This is where this process gets interesting. We have two methods to do this. In the traditional method of making I-beam strip ribs, the balsa blank is laid out and one fourth inch intervals are marked from top to bottom. The rib template is positioned at the uppermost marks and a knife or balsa stripper is used to slice the ribs. In the method I use now, a board is laid out to accept the balsa rib blank. An eighth inch thick shim block has a pivot point which accepts the front of the rib template. A balsa positioning rib is glued to the base. The balsa rib blank is pre-cut to the airfoil shape and then inserted in the fixture and forced up against the positioning rib. The rear of the rib template has a tab attached to it which rests against the stop. The template is swung up until the tab hits the stop and the rib can be accurately stripped. The process is repeated as many times as required to produce enough ribs to make the wing. Half ribs are made in exactly the same way.
Well, all the parts are finished and ready to assemble. Let's take one more look at each individual part. I prefer to make my leading edges from AB grain balsa. The fixturing method of the I-beam wing requires that these pieces be a consistent width along their length. The core piece of the I-beam spar is cut from quarter or C-grain balsa. The top caps are made from AB grain, and as mentioned before, the doublers are made from 1 16th inch thick plywood. The trailing edge pieces are flatted for the control horn. Remember this is a swept forward trailing edge design and these flats will become a straight line when assembled. They are also grooved to accept the wire. A slightly oversized airfoil is drawn on the tip fixtures to allow accurate trimming and block sanding after the wing is complete. All of the ribs are cut from AB grain balsa. Note that the flap horn has been installed prior to assembly of the wing. Assemble the fuselage, spar, trailing edge, leading edge, and tip fixtures as shown. Weight this assembly on a flat bench. With squares, check the alignment of the fuselage sides to the front of the spar. Once you're absolutely sure everything is square, glue the spar to the fuselage sides. Square the tip fixtures in the same manner. Tack glue the tip fixture to the bench. Glue the spar to the tip fixture. Repeat this process on the other tip. Check alignment of the trailing edges, then CA in place. Check alignment of the trailing edges. Add showing centers. Glue the tabs to the bench and pin the leading edges to them after checking alignment. Glue leading edges.
The forward edges of the spar caps will need to be planed for the ribs to fit properly. Check the shape often and carefully using a rib. Lightly block sand the caps as required to achieve a perfect spar to rib fit. This is the type of fit you're looking for. Repeat this process for the bottom spar cap. Check the plan for rib spacing and mark the spar. Lightly bevel the rib to fit the leading edge angle. Offset the trailing edge of the rib towards the center approximately one quarter inch and mark with a blade. Cut the ribs at this mark. Check the fit of the rib and sand the trailing edge of the rib if necessary. The top of the rib should sit approximately 1 64th of an inch above the trailing edge. It will be blended later. When satisfied with the fit, glue the rib in place. Install the remaining full ribs in the wing in the same manner. Except for the ribs in the landing gear area, leave these out for now.
With a straight edge, check the accuracy of your work. When the bottom ribbing is complete, cut tip fixtures free. Carefully remove the pins from the leading edge tabs. Do not remove the tabs from the bench. Turn the assembly over and reposition the leading edges against the tabs. Shim the fuselage level with a balsa block and re-glue the tip fixtures to the Install the remaining full ribs. This time leave two ribs out of the landing gear area. completed our work in the jig. Before we can go any further with ribs, we have to install our landing gear. I'll show you that method right now. Bend at least 16 retaining clips from no less than 40 thousandths copper wire. Using CA glue, reattach the landing gear to the spar.
Insert a copper clip over the landing gear and through the spar. Using duckbill pliers, twist the clip ends firmly against the spar. Clip off the excess wire. This is the front view of an installed clip. Slow cure epoxy is applied to the ends of the clips. Be sure to fill the holes with epoxy. We've installed our landing gear as you can see. We're now going to do the rest of the ribs. After that we'll carve our tips. Slightly oversized, we'll show you that. We'll go on then to our half ribs. There's a few little tricks in that. And we'll show you that also. The top ribs and one of the bottom ribs in the landing gear areas are installed in the normal manner. Trim the tip fixtures at this time, cutting slightly outside the line, and lightly block sand. Here's how I check the fit of the half ribs before gluing. Now install the remaining half ribs. Here's another method of gluing the half ribs.
Measure from the plans and mark the half ribs for trimming. Lay a straight edge between the two marks and put a pencil tick mark on each half rib. Trim the ribs with a fresh razor blade. Measure and tick mark again to locate the rear rib supports. Using 332nd by 316th balsa strips, install the supports. The landing gear half rib, as well as the four root ribs, are cut from 3 quarter inch sheet balsa. Sand the pieces again individually. Trim and fit the leading edge half rib. Mark the gear exit hole location. Note the exit hole is biased to the front. Now install the final landing gear station rib in the normal manner. A 132nd inch plywood trailing edge doubler is installed now. Use CA glue whenever gluing to carbon.
All right, we've got all our wing ribs in now. We're going to leave them out closest to the fuselage. I'll explain that later. Right now, we're going to cut the trailing edges off in order to prepare them for our wingtips. I'm going to use a Dremel tool. Make sure you wear some safety glasses because one of those little guys can be pretty nasty. We'll do that now. Block sand after cutting. Open a slot in the inboard rib for lead out clearance. Tape together two pieces of one half inch balsa and using the pin punch method, lay out the wingtips. Now cut the tips out using a scroll saw. I've tacked the tips in place to show the wing shape. Do not glue at this time. We've finished our wing. Uh, all our ribs are in. Wing is basically complete. I've held off these center ribs, installing them. The reason being that they're put in after the blocks have been carved and sanded. They have a tendency to, to beat them up with the sanding block otherwise. I do tape them also while I'm doing that. Tape the leading. You can put something across the top there, but definitely tape the trailing. Next thing I do is I sand these wings. Sanding is a very important part of this. It's almost how little sanding you can do uh, makes a better wing. It keeps the integrity of the wing. I work my way up from the trailing edges, and you remember when we built this, we left about a 64th here, just enough that we could feel it. We work forward with our block to about the spar. Carve your leading edge and take your time with that. I make a little foam attachment, a little uh, fixture, if you will, out of uh, 180 or 220. And after I've carved close and sanded with a block, I then work my way along with that. It's very important. You can destroy the whole airplane in this carving, as you can any other airplane. I think a lot of the problems with airplanes we have right now fall in the first third of the wing. Once that is done, you blend your tips in. Now, I've only tacked these tips in place 
just to show you the wing. You've pretty well built the airplane at this time. This is you've done all your critical items. Uh, I hope this takes some of the uh, the questions out of this. Uh, I do a few little things to take a little more weight off. I tr trim these on an angle. Just little odds and ends that you'll see as you go. There's very few things that, that need to be uh, rethought or reshaped at this time. And as I say, I hope this uh, uh, gives you this complete wing. The only thing I will touch on at this point uh, is the bell crank. If you're going to build a standard one, the plans show the installation through the beam. And uh, the only reason I don't like that right now is because we're using carbon. carbon. But the, uh, and I would mount at that time behind the beam. I use two eighth inch plates, trap them between the sides. They're mounted like a D-tube. The, the bolt traps right down between or the wire traps down between. Very obvious method. Or you can bolt up halfway through the spar, at which time you would put a flat plate on the bottom half of the cutout. That's a very easy method and these center sections are so strong that uh, unless you would really dig a lot of holes in there, you almost couldn't hurt it by mounting the bell crank. I'm going to use a four inch in here. Plans recommend a three inch. And I think that about does it for now. Uh, I certainly wish you the best with these. And uh, Take your time, do good work, and uh, I think you'll be very happy with these wings.